All right, we're back. Uh, part two. Okay, come on, quiet down. All right, here we go. Uh, so I gave you a, a kind of tour of like some of the broader concerns of AI and the the idea of the, like, the conversational machine was maybe like the you know the the kind of one of the ultimate aims there as per Turing. But uh, but we're supposed to be talking about games, which isn't really so much about conversational agents. Although it could be. Imagine if the NPCs in a game could actually have like good conversations with you, not just the I am talking wallpaper. Uh, you know, here, here is your quest. Um, it might be good if we could do it. But in games, um, I found, uh, so I was, again, I was using 2000 as my anchor point because that's when, you know, Turing said you'd have HAL, right? Um, and I found that uh, there are publications in uh, about game AI from like, 2005, uh, somebody's, just somebody's master's dissertation. And I don't want really to pick on the guy, but it's to show you where we are. And this was a dissertation that's about things like um, how to do the, the AI in 1980s platform games like Bubble Bobble. I don't know if you know Bubble Bobble, but it's just a couple of wee guys jumping up and down platforms. It's the kind of thing that you're doing right now. Bubble Bobble is one of is the kind of thing you could have done if I'd asked you, uh, if you'd have selected it. Um, and it's just, you know, uh, so this is like a, a you know, just a, a master's dissertation thing. It's not that big a deal, but it's dealing with like simple stuff like jumpy platform games. If I scroll down, I think there are some images that uh, help to illustrate. Uh, the kind of thing that we were we kind of talking about, trying to figure out how to do game AI. Um, hope I'm not wasting too much time. There we go. He's like, you know, how to do Mario and Dill Pitfall. Um, I think if we keep going, you get Bubble Bobble somewhere. Maybe I should search for it. Oh, bubble. Uh, yeah, okay. Oh, dear. Right, search for the second one. Actually get the reference. There we go. So that's Bubble Bobble, an old 1980s game, a platform game where you, you jump around and spit bubbles at bad guys and freeze them and release them and we're talking about you know it's it's discussing how to do uh simple parabolic jumps on a platform game right and it's like that this is you know this is like a thesis quality work so uh, ai in games is not super sophisticated um that's just the way it is i find it a bit depressing but it's you know i mean i'm, I'm part of this too like uh you know i've worked on games with ai and uh, again, it's just it's just mostly route finding and some simple things like calculating jump trajectories. Uh, nothing, nothing of the kind of highfalutin. Oh my God, they're going to take over the world now. They're more intelligent than we are. No, haven't haven't got there yet. Um, in fact, there's actually a debate as to whether the stuff in games counts as AI. I used to say it didn't, but back in the nineties, I would say we shouldn't call what we're doing AI. It's going to confuse people because to me, AI is like you know thinking machines, and it's like now nah, a wee guy that goes back and forth whenever he's x coordinate. You know, when he's x coordinate less than hundred, he flips, and then when it's when it's more than two hundred, he flips. It's like no, I'm sorry, that's not AI. That's just that's just a dude. That's, what are you talking about? But we had to call it something. So by convention, we always call it you know the AI. But it's really just you know the logic behind the moving entities, and it's like Jesus, don't like, don't imagine that it's intelligence though. Um, so you know a little, a little bit of a disappointment. That's why I talked about the other stuff because I like real AI, and it kind of disappoints me that all we have in games is kind of simple stuff. But well, there you go. Maybe you have to start somewhere. And indeed, the kind of the simple behaviours you get in the kind of games that we've got, they're, they're the beginning of something. Even that decision, you know, when to turn round or when to attack or defend, it's like, well, it's part of what a brain does. You know, a brain takes in sensory information about the world, and uh, and triggers behavioural responses. Uh, you know, in real animals, usually with the goal of securing food and mating opportunities, and that's what it's all about. You know, that's what brains evolved to do to just take in cues from the world and trigger. I think, and trigger the reactions that are needed to keep life going. Um, so basically, AI in computer games refers to anything that's more intelligent than a rock. Because uh, because rocks, it's like, you know, they're just totally inertial. You set them off in their velocity and they just move and there's nothing else, right? Like in asteroids, literally, the rocks, right? But anything fancier than a rock counts as AI in computer games. Um, it's, it's basically just anything that, you know, that if it were real, it would have a brain. Like, you know, asteroids don't have brains, right? Uh, but if you had, um, you know, like an enemy ship or something like that that tries to attack you and stuff, it's like, well, at some level, if it were real, that spaceship would have a, a thing inside it with a brain driving it, right? So it's just like, if you're doing like the world's simplest brain simulation, we, we allow ourselves to pretend that it's AI. Um, so in fact, in some games, the definition of intelligence is so broad as to include things like football players. So if you get football players in a soccer game or something, they're AI. Uh, you've got soldiers in one of your silly war shoot 'em up games. They're AI. 
Uh, in fact, it even extends to fish. Uh, famously, there was a year uh, when the Call of Duty people were incredibly impressed with their fish AI system, uh, and, uh, and they made a promotional video about it, or at least they made a video and then somebody edited it to make it funnier. So here we go. Have you seen this? Have you seen fish? Have you seen the AI fish? Uh, you're about to be impressed. Here at Infinity Ward, we're really excited that we get to be the studio that brings fish into the next generation. With this being an all-new Call of Duty, we've really taken this opportunity to revamp fish. We've added fluid dynamics, interactive smoke, and also added an AI system to it. So we have fish move out of the way when you get close to them. This is powered by a new next-gen engine that gives us amazing graphic fidelity and really innovative fish. We have the best fans in the world, and we're committed to creating for them a new next generation Call of Duty experience. One of the key reasons Call of Duty has been as successful as it is, is we focus on fish. It's the thing we design for. It's the thing that drives our success as a franchise. And with all of the new tech, all of the new story, everything that we're putting into this next generation Call of Duty, we are still 60 frames a second, low latency controls, a great feeling game. So there you go, that's the, uh, the fish. Uh, I think it's fair to say that in games, the graphics guys have made more progress than the AI guys. <laughs> that's all I'm saying, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. On the good side, that's all you need to do, right? You just, like, uh, fish are a classic kind of AI thing where it's a, a shoal thing, yeah, where you just have a collection of agents and they individually do very simple things. You know, they just, like, move away from a threat or move towards a food source. And it's very simple logic. And you put a bunch of those together, though, and the result, actually, it's called flocking behavior. You can go and read papers about how to do flocking, birds, fish, other kind of group animals like that. And they can, it can actually look quite nice. You know, it's quite a cool thing. Um, and the individuals are just doing very simple operations and they're very simple little brains. Uh, so that's actually a thing you can do. You create simple agents um, that just have some, you know, fairly simple objectives in life. For example, the one I'm mentioning, just keep walking back and forth. Uh, and, and when the character gets close enough to you, shoot him and keep doing that until one of you is dead. It's like, okay, you can write that up. It's a couple lines of code. It's no big deal. That's how a lot of the bad guys in platform games do it. You know, they're just on a fixed path and there's a little check they do every so often to see if the player is close enough and then they shoot at them, maybe even aim if they're being fancy. Uh, and if they throw a projectile, actually, working out how to throw projectiles is interesting. You actually have to calculate, you know, how it might go. A bit more involved there. But it's simple stuff. It's almost like there's nothing to say. You just you just write it. It's just code. Um, so in order to do this, you have a you know simple bit of state as to like, am I in attack mode? Am I in retreat mode? Am I on the platform? What am I doing? Um, a little bit of memory. Have I seen the player yet? You know how many bullets have I got left in my gun? And maybe they use the spatial manager to do range checks so they can say you know is the is he close enough to attack or something? And that's all you do. Um, you can do a little bit more than that if you want. For example, you can add like tracking, avoidance behavior. You can do if you have to do like, you know computing jumps from one place to another. That you can actually just do the math to work out at what point you would need to jump and at what velocity in order to get somewhere else. It's just working out parabolic curves. But again, we wouldn't call that AI. You know, I would call that like physics. It's like a physics problem. You know, like you launch a projectile from here at which velocity in order for it to end up here. Um, to me, it's just like a calculus problem. Um, but I guess in a, in a way, in real life, you know, a, a, an end like if a frog's working out how to do a jump, is it doing calculus in its head to work out what? You no, know, it's got instincts that kind of you know that, that help it know what to do. But the instincts are basically doing are computing that calculation somehow. So you know, it's uh, kind of weird. Um, yeah, so you just write into the update logic, you make it do what it needs to do, and I can't really tell you much more than that. Um, it's not exactly brain surgery. You've already seen that quote, uh, so it's easy. Um, but as, as I've kind of indicated, though, you can sometimes get quite good effects from this, even though you're writing like very simple, like primitive brains. Um, sometimes it can be convincing in certain contexts, especially if you get them together in groups. Like if you create individual agents that are very dumb, but you have a bunch of them all together, and because they're in different positions from each other, you know, the, the, if they're all calculating like their distance from us, like a, a bang or something like that that they're reacting to, they're all slightly different positions, so they all, you know, compute a slightly different response to it, and you end up with this kind of herd behaviour where some of them do one thing, some of them do another thing, and it can look okay. Um, 
you can actually kind of go down this route of pretending that you're simulating animals by giving your AI like sense organs. So you can do things where you know you you say, okay, he's going to make a decision, but it depends on what he can see. So you give him like a cone of sight. So rather than rather than magically knowing where everyone is on the map, they only know where things are within a little kind of V shape in front of them that would be where they could see. And you just do line of sight stuff. And if you do it that way, it's like yeah, they'll when somebody you know in, a, in like a stealth game, you could have it so that you know as they turn around, as something enters their cone of vision, they react to it. And I said, well, that seems plausible, and that's what those sort of stealth games do. You know, they just have a simple cone there, and they cast out rays, and uh, and then they they maybe have ears. So you know, things in the game that make sound, and the AI has just got a thing where they can do like a spatial check around their head at some smaller distance to see whether there are any. Uh, sound events going off. It's kind of like a collision, only instead of like physical overlap, it's proximity. So if they hear a noise within a certain distance, you know, it alerts them, and then they maybe turn in that direction. Um, so you can do this kind of thing. You can even give them moods, uh, which is what we would call a state machine. So you can have like a patrolling bad guy, who again, stealth games are a good reference for this. You know, sometimes they're they're just on patrol and they don't really care. But sometimes they're in a state of alert, like if they've heard something, you know, they become a bit more suspicious and they stop and they, you know, they look around and everything. That's him just moved into this, you know, suspicion state. And then if they actually hear gunfire, they go into full on alert state where the path might change and where they get the gun out. So that's just it. They've just got a, a member variable inside the, the entity. What state am I in? You know, uh, idle, neutral, smoking, you know, they stop and have a fag. Uh, Alert, attack, you know, and you just and you just have logic that makes it transition between these states. Um, it's all quite simple, really. And you can you can do the state transitions either you can kind of hard code them, or you can make it weigh up a bunch of different things. It's like there might be, you know, uh, you, you compute a factor as to like how suspicious is he and how hungry is he and how bored is he, and as those numbers go up and down, you decide which state to put them in. You know, whichever one of those sort of emotional forces. Is the strongest. You, you make it trigger a state change. So we actually did all this back in the 90s in that old tank game that I made. Um, the AI in that game is actually really good for its time. Um, so the the little enemy tanks in that game, you know, they're kind of partly trying to hunt you down, but they're also defending the power core things, and they can do route finding, and they have got simulated senses, so they can hear you if you as you approach. And there's actually quite good stuff there uh, where. Uh, there's a little system there where they, they weigh up a bunch of different calculations all the time, including things like whether they're near their friends. It's like they're more aggressive if they know they've got backup. Uh, but if you start to you know kill their enemies, uh, kill their friends, or if they're they're on their own, they realise that they're more vulnerable and they're more likely to retreat. And this actually leads to real tactics in the game where you know you want to kind of split them up so that they they aren't so confident and aggressive. Um, so we kind of did all this. They they have a whole bunch of like. Uh, different kind of simulated emotions about how aggressive they are, how frightened they are, how much they want to protect the base, how much they want to attack you, and the, the, this leads to them not exactly triggering states, but it, it changes them their decisions to whether to like go towards you or away from you, and whether they want to route find to their home base or not. Uh, that's that's all stuff that was done. Yeah. Um, so that kind of works quite well. Agents can be quite good. Um, and yes, uh, emergent behaviour is one of the cool things that happens. If you take a lot of simple agents, you can get these like flocking behaviours or crowd behaviours that are often more convincing than individual behaviour. Um, in fact, in GTA, the early GTA had like really primitive AI, but people used to believe that stuff was happening in it, like you know that people were like uh, you know reacting to particular events. You know that the pedestrians were like you know. Uh, were, were kind of dispersing because you'd started shooting someone and stuff like that. And it wasn't always the case. Often what was going on was simpler than people thought, but the emergent effect and a little bit of expectation on the part of the player meant that some people thought the AI was, was doing cleverer things than it really was. Um, so that's for like kind of simple behaviour of these kind of groups of simple agents. Um, but the other thing you do sometimes get in games, of course, is you get NPCs and you get conversational interactions. And I think you all know they're rubbish, basically, right? Uh, they're all just hard coded. It's just a tree of like I say four things, and you pick this one, and I go to this tree here, and the game designers just write it all, and it's all very predictable, and you can make them repeat themselves and say stupid things. It's all just a simple tree of a uh, branching tree of uh, statements that they make. Um, so it's not very good, and that's one of the things that shows that, that is. It's obviously weak, you know, you, to the point where you don't even pretend anymore when you're playing games. You know that, that you're just interacting with a, a decision tree, 
but it's it's obviously unconvincing. Um, but we've seen that from the Loebner Prize that doing convincing dialogue exchanges is hard. That's one of the things that might get better in the future, though, as these language models improve. I'm curious as to whether someone might try and embed one in a game. Uh, but it's difficult to shape them. You know, you need to like you put the language model in, but you also need to make sure that it knows to give you the quest, which is what it's really there for. And it's like, how do you shape it? There was a game that tried, I think, to have two different chatbots of some description inside of the. It's called Bizarre, I think. I haven't heard of that. It was a pretty uh, most tactical thing. It was like just similar to the scene where you're in like the dinner party. All right. It comes out and then ah. talks to each other and kind of just. Uh huh. It was kind of clunky. It was a couple of years ago. Everyone's okay. Comments, yeah. Well, I mean, so I think there's, there's potential there, but it's like a lot of these things. It's difficult. You can, when you have an emergent technology, you can do some things with it, but often it's hard to make it do exactly what you want. Like in the early days of physics systems, uh, people tried to do some things, but the physics systems could be very brittle. You know, think there was uh, things we kind of like. You know, you get bad collision explosions and stuff. Or uh, you know, a physics-based game, it's easy. It's possible to get objects into places where you can't get them. You know, you knock them down holes, or they get destroyed, and it's like, oh, but that was a critical object, and it got destroyed because we had real physics in the game, and it got crushed by something. So it might be the same if they start to put language AI systems into games. There'll have to be a lot of shaping to make sure that. Um, that you still get what like, the essential stuff happens, you know, like the, the quest items get delivered, and you don't put them into a state where they'll never talk to you again, and you can't make progress in the game because you've offended them, uh, or whatever it might be. So it'll be hard to do it. Um, but I'll, I'll go back to talking about chatbots a little bit because I showed you some of the statistical ones that we use nowadays. But the uh, the history of chatbots is interesting. Um, have any of you heard of Eliza? You know, so Eliza was the first chatbot. This was the original one. Um, it was done, and by it was done back in the 60s. So this is where all chatbots begin. Uh, so here's the Wikipedia article. So Eliza's a pretty simple thing, uh, but there were people in the, in the day who, when they first saw this in the 60s who were convinced by it. There are stories about people that weren't computer experts and they would be given the Eliza machine told to talk to it and told it was a computer, but like, they got into it. They thought that, they thought that it was helping them. Uh, Eliza pretends to be a psychiatrist. Uh, and they would like start typing in their like, secret you know problems and fears and stuff. And Eliza was a fairly simple you know question and answer system, not very fancy, but uh, it, it did it did convince some people. And it's actually available online. You can go and talk to Eliza if you want. Um, so the idea with Eliza was uh, it was part of the reason it was made to pretend to be a psychiatrist is because the guy who wrote it realized that there was a type of thing called a, a type of movement in psychiatry called Rogerian uh, psychiatry that often involved just getting people to clarify their own thoughts. So basically, it's the kind of psychiatrist that just says, and what do you feel about that? You know, tell me more. And it's like, well, that's quite easy to fake. So that's why it was done this way. So uh, it was, well, do it, do any, any problems you want to tell Eliza? Uh, I am worried about the exam. Didn't know. No. Why no? Well, it's stressful, and I haven't written it yet. <laughs> you see? That's right. I've been busy. Uh, So you see, it's like, it gives these like sh kind of stupid responses, and, and, and all it's doing is it, it takes your sentence and it can parse it a little bit, and then it basically just sends it back to you, and it can turn like you know when you say I, it can say you, and it's got some substitution rules and a, a couple of standard responses to certain things. Uh, so you see, just it kind of echoes what you're saying back to you in a sort of semi-grammatical way. So I, I've never found it particularly convincing, but you know if you're if you're a certain type of gullible or you just talk to it in the right way. It can almost work. Uh, how are you feeling? Uh, <laughs> okay, so that's Eliza. Uh, so that's that's the first one. Um, and uh, yeah, so it, it literally is literally true. It pretended to be a psychiatrist because that's a behaviour that can be simulated despite knowing almost nothing of the real world. That's that's what he said in the paper uh, behind it. And Eliza was written in a language called Lisp that you might know. It's what you know scheme that you do racket, schemes. Racket, of, racket. Yeah, what? Yeah, racket. Yeah. Uh, so it, Lisp was the original uh, parenthesis heavy language, and it was invented as a language for doing AI in. It was invented by John McCarthy, and he wanted like a high level language that would help you solve these difficult problems and a language that would be kind of good at manipulating words and text, which Lisp 
arguably sort of is, maybe. Uh, Wait, that was the original idea. I mean, it's well, partly. Well, it was. It was definitely for AI purposes. Uh, I, I, I could say more about that because, like, okay, it's all atoms and stuff, but the atoms and lists could be seen as words, uh, and it can do. You know, manipulating lists is manipulating sentences. Uh, it, you, you can debate it, but it definitely was part of the intention. It was intended for doing uh, textual AI. Anyway, uh, if you want, you should try asking Siri about Eliza sometime and see what she has to say about it. Don't do it right now in the middle of the lecture. Um, okay, so uh, I'll give you a bit of insight on how Eliza worked. Um, I think, is this a link maybe to the, the paper? Yeah, uh, or is a, a summary of how it worked? Um, but I think you can see already what it does. It just takes your sentence. It knows how to carve it up a little bit. It knows some key words to look for. It's got certain verbs that it recognises. It knows how to invert uh, pronouns, you know, you, me, uh, can flip them backwards. But basically, it's just got a bunch of canned phrases that it tries to do as, as responses to your input. It's not very advanced. Um, okay, so that's basically what it does. It just looks for certain magic keywords that it knows about. Like if you put in, you know, I am unhappy, I am scared, it's probably got, it knows those words, and that'll, it felt it's got a big, a big if statement, you know, and it says, oh, you got the word scared, and it's got maybe a response to that saying, oh, you know, don't worry, it'll be okay, whatever it is, and it just kind of picks up a, a standard response. Very, you know, very predictable. Um, that's basically all it does. And uh, that idea, the simple text parsers, is what actually became the basis of a, a type of game, uh, the text adventure game. Any of you ever played text adventures or know what they are? Only a couple. So, uh, you, you know what Zork? Yeah, where it's like one of these sort of, uh, you know, you are in a, you know, exploring a kind of Mythical world, uh, this kind of thing. Just like a terminal. Yeah, like a fantasy world, and you just say, uh, so you know, open open mailbox because it says there's a mailbox. No, uh, examine leaflet, this kind of thing. You ever played these type of games? No, these are quite good. I used to play these when I was young, um, and that's and they've got simple text parsers that are a bit like how Eliza works. They can identify verbs and nouns. And it allows you to go through this sort of, uh, you know, these often kind of fantasy themed environments where you go and, you know, you're searching for some magical amulet or something and you have to go and like, kill monsters or something. There's even versions of like, uh, there's one that they used to be based on The Hobbit, where you can, you know, play the story of The Hobbit as a text adventure. Um, there's also one based on, you know, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Yeah. So it had one as well that was considered to be very good and you can play a version of it. It was supposed to be brutally difficult. It is brutally difficult, yes. Um, Wasn't there an issue with these where quite often there would be a bottleneck where it, you couldn't properly input what it wanted, so it got stuck in some segment? I'm not sure if it's exactly that, but they could be brittle because the parsers weren't very good. They're basically verb noun parsers, and if you couldn't think of exactly the right word, sometimes it would fail. But they got better. Like in the by the late '80s, they had they, some of them were quite good. Like you could type in pretty good sentences, like you know, uh, like. Uh, take the amulet and throw it down the well or something. And you could say it would work. And it would like, understand there were two actions and it knew what the amulet was because that's an object in the game. And like, joining words like and and stuff, it would just sort of ignore or it knew what they, it, it just knew from context what they meant. And it would basically, it looks at your sentence, it tries to find your verbs and your nouns and it looks those up in a list of things that it knows how to do. And it just performs those actions inside the game. And you would just sit there and you'd type away what you wanted to do and you'd progress through these little adventures. That's what we did before things to create super graphical or 3D. So there are did a whole set of games that work this way, that have got text interaction. And you know nobody thinks they're dealing with an intelligent entity, but you are communicating in text with the computer in a kind of specialized domain. And they're quite, they're quite good fun. The puzzles are good. I realize that the lack of graphics might kind of mean that uh, you young folks nowadays who've been spoiled and think that this is rubbish, but it can be interesting. Um, try to remember what you have to do at the start of Hitchhiker, and you have to uh, uh, look. Uh, open, open door, switch on light. Hey, uh, you got some objects here. Take a, take a toothbrush. Take toothbrush. Okay. Uh, I know what I have to. I have to take the. I have, there's a. I have to take a headache pill that's in my pocket. Uh, but anyway, I shouldn't just. I shouldn't just play the game. But mm -hmm. that's what you do. You and the puzzles to solve. And you know, it's it, Hitchhiker's kind of a comic one as well. What the books were. So you can play these kind of things. All right, so that's basically how uh, that sort of stuff works. 
Uh, if you want to know the, the paper that actually described ELISA, you can actually get that here. Um, so one of the things about ELISA, though, is that um, it's very kind of repetitive. It's got, for example, uh, it tends to say the same thing over and over again. It doesn't remember the rest of the conversation. So it's got no thread. So, you know, each sentence is pro literally, if you look at the code, each sentence that you type in is processed independently. So if you say the same thing over and over again, it usually gives you exactly the same response, although some versions have got a little bit of randomness in there. So it maybe picks from one of three canned answers instead of exactly one. But it never learns anything. It doesn't remember what your first problem was if you move on to your second problem. You know, it's just really dumb, right? So in the paper, uh, Wiesenbaum, the guy who wrote it, suggests that an ELISA-like system would be made more interesting if it actually could gain knowledge over time. You know, instead of just being a, a, basically a function that takes an input sentence and produces a response, it actually remembered what you'd said and it learned some knowledge about the world, or if it actually had any curiosity about the world, which ELISA doesn't really, that this would make it more plausible. So you really want to have your bot be able to like, learn stuff over time, um, either from the external world, being told by the person who's interacting, or figured out by you know by other uh, things that the user provides. Um, uh, so I have a kind of feeling about this that yes, if you wanted to make an, a chatbot better, one of the things you'd want to do is actually have a, give it an agenda. You know, give it something that it wants, like a, you know, real living things. They've got goals that they're trying to pursue, and I think if you wanted to make the system plausible, you should have it have a goal that it's trying to navigate towards. Um, and that would make it more interesting. Have it be curious about things, have it like want to learn something, and it would ask you a question because it would want to know about something, and it would update its knowledge base. Uh, those are the kind of things you would maybe do if you wanted to make a chatbot seem like something other than the what we call talking wallpaper, you know, these things that just, you can just tell them, they're just bouncing stuff back to you, they're not, they're not any good. Um, so one of the things you could make your conversational entity be interested in might be games themselves. At which, so at this point, I have to say, uh, how many of you got around to watching war games? Anybody? No? Okay. So you still get one more chance, because I won't really be spoiling it heavily until Wednesday. Uh, but here's a bit of war games, where there is indeed a conversational AI that has an interest in games. We're in. We're in. So honestly, it's a really good film. You know, it's a you know, it was a popular mainstream movie. It takes some liberties, but the guys who wrote it actually know their stuff. You can tell they've done the research. For example, there's a character in it called Professor Falcon, who is the guy who's like created this AI thing in the past, and he's an amalgam of of various like, real computer scientists, people like uh, John von Neumann. Um, and uh, and some of the other early AI pioneers. He's actually he's a fusion of quite a few things, um, but it's all it's all quite well done. You know, it's a kind of pseudo history of how early AI was done, and they did indeed start trying to work out simple game playing game theory. It's called, um, and then eventually that extended to be able to think about the the game theoretical aspects of war and the idea about planning how to execute a nuclear war, which is a is a kind of a big game where your move is to fire missiles at the other guy. And that's kind of the, the theme in the movie. Because in the 80s, there was a lot of uh, still a lot of Cold War paranoia and a lot of real fear about nuclear war. Uh, and that's what the film is ultimately about. OK. Um, so this is back to a Turing quote. Uh, we may hope that machines will eventually compete with men in all purely intellectual fields, but which are the best ones to start with? Even this is a difficult decision. Many people think that a very abstract activity like playing chess would be best. 
and that's Turing. I think not from the Computer Machinery and Intelligence paper. This is from an interview that he gave the same year that I found. So this is, a, remember I'm saying that a purely conversational machine uh, is maybe a bit vacant, but if you give it some purpose or agenda, it perhaps gives it more plausibility as being like a thinking agent. So the idea was, well, give, give it something to do, make it play chess. And that was always one of the classic AI problems, you know, how to do chess. Um, but chess is quite hard, so let's start with something simpler than chess. Tic-tac-toe, or knots and crosses, as we call it in Britain. Uh, what, what do you, what, what, what's it called in Icelandic? you have your name for it? Minla. Minla. Minla, okay. Uh, so the thing about tic-tac-toe that's convenient for our purposes is it's, it's kind of like chess in that it's a... It's what's called a perfect information game, and in that both players can see the board all the time, and you take turns each. All right? So it's alternating turns, perfect information, simple rules about win, losing, and drawing, and the rules are kind of fixed and so on. So it's tic tac toe is like a super simplified version of chess. If you wanted to write chess, you'd maybe write tic tac toe first to learn how you're doing it. Um, so let's say we're going to try and write an AI that can play tic tac toe. What are we going to do? How do you how do you make it be clever enough to do that? What do you do? What do you do? F statements. F statements, yeah, pretty much. Um, I'm afraid the strategy is use brute force. Uh, the horrible thing about a lot of AI historically is that it, the, the actual techniques are really dumb. Like I used to think about this when I was a kid, think about, well, what do I do when I'm playing these games? You know, and how do I figure out what the smart move is? Um, and you can say, well, I'm doing lots of things, you know, I'm, uh, but but you have to really crystallise that into something that's very mechanical that you could describe to a machine. So although I've got like you know flashes of inspiration and insight and stuff like that, it's like I can't code that. I can't write in my like basic basic program like do insight. It's like I have to know. It's like I can't do that. So it's got to be like well okay. I guess I would like I would sort of think about there are nine places where I can put it. I guess I have to think about each of the nine places and work out which is the best one. And it's like oh god that seems really dumb. But at some level I guess that's what I'm doing right. I'm thinking about all the moves that I'm allowed to make and I have to think well which one is advantageous to me I just I just have to think about every damn thing brute force basically and this is this is how it used to be done so the way you do make a computer play games at tic-tac-toe is you make it consider every legal move and and imagine having played that move and then imagine the consequences you know the counter move it's like okay what would my opponent do and then if he did that what would I do and you just keep thinking ahead as far as you can until you run out of time or memory and then and then you pick the one that looks like the best. So you basically just imagine all the future possibilities that the, the rules of the game will allow uh, until some point. And then you say, OK, uh, which one which one has got me winning by the most? And you say, OK, I'm going to try and go that way. That's all it is. Um, so you look through a tree of moves. So you have, to, you have a, an initial node, which is the current state. And then you create child nodes that are all the possible moves that you're allowed to make legally. And then there are, ch there are child nodes under those that have the counter moves to your opponent. And you keep going, you just build this big tree in your head or in the computer's memory. And, uh, and I suppose in some level that kind of is what people do when they play games. You know, you do think ahead, except that I think you tell that, you know, as a human, you start to learn shortcuts. You know, you learn things like if ever you see two in a row, you've got to block it. You're like, I didn't need to check all the other points. And you find, well, if there's two in a row, I've got to block it, otherwise I lose. Um, and that's the kind of thing that we can't quite get computers to just to just see that, uh, but that's kind of what we'd want them to do. Um, so it ends up being like this. Uh, uh, so tic-tac-toe is pretty simple, and although I said like there are nine initial moves in tic-tac-toe, there's a lot of symmetry in that game, of course. So you know all the corners if, uh, for the first move, they're functionally the same. You can just rotate them. Right? So there's really only three moves you can make at the start. You can go in the center, the edge, or a corner. So you do that, and then for each of those, there's the counter move. If you've gone in the centre, then you can go either in the you can go in the corner, you can go in the edge, and you can just see it. You just play it out, right? So you work out the computations. You do the rotation trick, so that you don't compute more states than you need. You just orient them all to a standard orientation, and you work out the tree. Um, and it turns out that uh, tic tac toe is simple enough that with a reasonable amount of computing power, you can just do that right to the end. You can compute all the moves right to the end of the game. So you can always pick like the best possible move, and that's why if you play a good tic-tac-toe program now, uh, if it's been implemented correctly, uh, it'll never lose. It'll either be a draw or a victory. It's like the, there's there, it's basically tic-tac-toe is solved. Basically, we know how to play it in a perfect way that means that if you follow the rules, you'll never lose. Uh, but then 
That, but that doesn't mean you'll win because the other guy might also be following the best strategy. And if you put the two best strategies against each other, you end up with draws. And of course, tic tac toe famously is a game that when you get good at it, you always just, you always just end up drawing. Um, in more complex games like chess, it's actually a little bit harder than that. You haven't you aren't able to work out right to the end state of chess because chess is like a you know chess is like a huge game tree uh, that won't fit in memory even today. Um, so what you have to do there is uh, you go as far ahead as you can, and then you say, okay, I can I can think through your four moves ahead, and I don't none of those look, I, I don't have checkmate. You know, it's not like if, if one of them was checkmate, you'd pursue that avenue, but usually they're not checkmate yet. So you just have to decide well, which one's the best. Uh, so you do an evaluation based on like you know who's got the most pieces or something like that, or some other evaluation, and then you kind of work back from there, and that's called the minimax algorithm. So what you do there is you think ahead as far as you can, you evaluate the end state that you can imagine, and you give it a score, and then you say, okay, I've got these scores, but now I assume that well, every time I take a turn, I try and maximise my score, but my opponent is presumably sensible, so they're trying to minimise my score. You know, They're trying to maximise their score, which is the, the opposite. So the idea is that on alternate turns, it's like I'm trying to maximise the score, my opponent's trying to minimise it, I'm trying to maximise it, and you just work out those interactions and you bubble them all up and decide what your move is. Uh, so you end up with something like this. So this is where look, your initial state and you compute the successor states and you don't know what the scores are yet, so these are, these are empty when you're thinking. You just think about the successor moves that you can make and the counter moves and so on, and you get down to, you know, it's far ahead. Let's say you can think four moves ahead. And then what happens is that, okay, I'm maximizing. So this is my move. I need to decide whether to do this move or that move. Right? Uh, well, how, how do I pick which one's the best? Well, the idea is I go into the future and I look at these moves and I know that my opponent doesn't like me. So he wants to minimize my score. So he's got a choice between a score of like seven and five. Well, he'll pick the move that leads to a score of five because that's good for him. He's minimizing. So that means that basically this board position is also worth five because he'll definitely make the five move. He won't make the seven move. Uh, likewise here, minus 7 and minus 5, he'll make the minus 7 move. And then in other places, he hasn't got any choice. Or here, the minimum of plus infinity is I've won, right? infinite points. Uh, so that's as a move where you could have won with that move, but you only get 10 with that move. So he's going he's gonna to take the, the one that's the lesser of the two. So you take those two, and then so that's him. He minimizes at 10 and 5. You've got a choice between a board worth 10 and a board worth 5. Well, you'd pick the board worth 10. You're trying to maximize. So this position is implicitly worth 10, and you just work all the way up to the top. And then eventually you say, okay, I can go this way for a score of minus 10, I can go this way for a score of minus 7, what would I rather have? Well, neither of them are good, they're both negative, I'm losing, but I'd rather have minus 7. So you pick that, and then it says, okay, this is the path I'm going to go down. So that's how you, you compute the tree of potential moves, and then you navigate down it in the way that you think is going to give you the best result. And that's it. Brute force, mini-max, that is how these type of games were classically done. Um, so as I've said, tic-tac-toe is simple and is actually solvable. You can write a short program that plays tic-tac-toe. It's, it's not too hard. You don't even actually need to do the tree expansion because it turns out once you've done the tree expansion, you can look at it and say, yeah, there are rules like if there's ever two in a row, block it. And it, it, pe people know what the correct strategy is. Um, so you can do that. Uh, but it just leads to draws most of the time. Uh, Chess is harder, as I say. The chess tree is really big, and even modern machines can't do chess with brute force, although they were getting better at it. Um, it actually got to the point where uh, modern chess machines were so good that although chess used to be seen as like the big classic game AI problem, it got to the point where they needed something harder, and the harder thing is Go. Do you know about the game Go? Uh, just a game of like, black and white tiles on a, on a big grid. Um, so it turns out that Go has got an even more complex search space than chess has, and is considered by some to be a, you know, a more uh, sophisticated game. It's certainly harder for computers to play Go because uh, there are just so many pieces and so many moves that the tree just got, goes really, really big, really, really quickly. Um, so it's one of these things where, for a long time, uh, humans were still better at Go than machines were until just a few years ago, um, when eventually I think called AlphaGo. You heard about AlphaGo? Yeah, so AlphaGo eventually used neural nets and got good enough that it could it could beat human players at Go and, and actually trounce them now. But for a long time, we couldn't make computers be better than humans uh, at Go. Uh, we could make them better at chess, but even even that took time. But it, eventually, it did happen. Um, 
Okay, so these are the, the sort of so that's the idea of this like exhaustive search based brute force thing. So you can see that, for example, Go kind of proves that humans aren't really doing naive brute force because the computers were doing that and the computers couldn't win. It's obvious that human Go players are using insight and are doing pattern matching or they're doing something that's cleverer than brute force tree searches. And it's also true with good chess players. You know, good chess players, they do look ahead, but they aren't literally computing every possible move. They have a sense of like, They've got a plan, you know, I'm trying to I'm trying to move my queen up here so I'll get control of this part of the board, or you know, I've seen this pattern before, I, I'm I'm laying a trap. And computers don't really think that way, but humans do or can. Um, so that's how all that worked. Um, the other thing about chess are, are these other games that have got very big trees, is the tree is too big to explore fully, like Minimax explores the whole tree. There's a trick that you use to prune it so you don't basically you don't waste your time considering moves that are like a waste of time, you know, like pointless pawn moves that are very unlikely to be productive. You don't waste your time computing those ones. There's a, a more formal version of this called alpha beta pruning, where you can actually work out the, the upper and lower bounds of parts of the tree, and it basically stops you wasting your time exploring essentially useless dead ends in the tree. So that's a, an important technique. I won't explain it, I'll just name it so you know that it's one of the... Try and remember the name. Alpha beta pruning is one of the ways to optimise the tree. Um, so it turns out, though, that these basic techniques of brute force search that I mentioned, minimax and tree pruning, were used to create chess programs even as early as the 50s. And apparently uh, Turing actually came up with one as long ago as 1948, but it was uh, too big to implement it on the Manchester machine. It would be too slow, needed too much memory. So what Turing actually did is he wrote this program uh, called Turo Champ, uh, and he executed it by hand. You know, he just he just became the computer and ran through the program just to see if it would work kind of thing. I, I used to do this as well when I was a kid. You'd write little simple programs and I didn't have a computer yet. And you would just like, you know, you would just play computer. You would just execute the instructions in your head and write the numbers down. Uh, so he apparently did this, um, taking uh, 20 minutes or more to compute each move because he had to like do the dumb computer thing of like, actually working out, you know, ev moving every piece kind of hypothetically uh, and then evaluating the board. Really tedious, but he did it and apparently played chess with one of his friends, uh, wives, I think, using this algorithm, uh, which wasn't very good. I think I think he would sometimes win, but it wouldn't. Uh, it it wasn't a very good. It probably only looked one or two moves ahead or something. Uh, so it wasn't a very uh, a very competent uh, chess algorithm, but it was a chess algorithm. And someone else actually made a real a real chess program. They did run on the machine. A guy called Dietrich Prince. But it only dealt with like a simplified version of chess. I think it did end games. So if you had like only a small number of pieces left, you know, the last phase of it where the the, the search wasn't quite so exhaustive, um, it could actually play chess. So we've had we've had chess programs since the fifties. Um, and a guy called Claude Shannon, who's didn't we really know about Claude Shannon? He's quite he invented the the well. He's sometimes credited as inventing the word bet. Although he didn't, uh, someone else did. He used uh, the first, I think the first use of bet in a technical paper was by Claude Shannon. He's a pioneer of something called information theory, uh, very important for compression algorithms and stuff like that. And he wrote one of the first papers on computer chess. It basically tells you all, basically all the main ideas of how to make computers play chess were in this paper that, again, I think was 1950. Um, so basically all that happened from the 50s onwards is that we just threw more computing. But basically the algorithm was figured out. We knew that the algorithm for chess was brute force, uh, tree calculations, a bit of pruning, and just do it. And basically all that happened is chess programs got better, mostly because computers got faster and had more memory. You know, it wasn't really that anything super clever happened. They just had more power. Um, and IBM were big on this. IBM would, would create chess programs to kind of show off how great their computers were, just as like a, you know, Mostly for PR, more than anything. Um, but this is what happened. And this eventually culminated in 1997, when IBM's Deep Blue machine, which was just a, you know, a supercomputer that had been designed to be particularly effective at playing chess, uh, actually defeated the then world champion Gary Kasparov. So it, it took till 1997 before we had uh, computer supremacy on, on chess. I mean, you know, it only, it only beat him once. Uh, nowadays, I think it would, it would do some more reliably. But this was... Again, when I was growing up, this was a big deal. You know, that people used to say that oh, a computer will never beat a grandmaster at chess because computers are, you know, they're just machines. They can, they're just doing arithmetic. They'll never be able to capture the, you know, the genius of someone like Kasparov. And it's like, yeah, 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 whatever. Uh, eventually, brute force did win. The interesting thing is that with chess, brute force did win. 
with Go it didn't. You know, with Go we didn't brute force ourselves to success. We had to use different techniques. But anyway, in 1997, Deep Blue won, and Gary Kasparov accused it of cheating. <laughs> uh, it's a real story. Um, what apparently happened is that towards the end of the game that the computer won, um, it played a really unusual move, and uh, that obviously the machine was supposed to be working on its own. But of course, overnight the programmers would kind of analyze what it had done that day, and there was this thing about are they allowed to change anything in the program mid competition? Are they allowed to? Are the human operators allowed to give hints? And I think the rules are no, you're not allowed to. Uh, but but it played such a strange move that Kasparov felt that was not the kind of move a machine would make. It seemed like it was baffling to him. He didn't figure out, you know, why is it doing it? And he thought, no, that's a human move. That's not a computer move. And he complained about it. Uh, but apparently after the fact, they investigated it and they turned out that it did make a very strange move because of a bug. Uh, it actually made a mistake and it made a bad move. But it was so surprising to Kasparov that it really put him off his stride. And it may, in fact, have led, led, led him to lose because he got worried because it's like, I can't figure out what it's doing. And <laughs> what happened is it had run out of memory and it had picked a bad, it had picked a bad move by mistake. And he was thinking, shit, it's got something on me here. So that apparently is the story there. Uh, and here, of course, again in 2000. So in 1997, we could, we could beat a grandmaster at chess. In 2001, in the film, uh, Hal is able to win at chess. Um, it's just a short clip, but you, I'll, uh, I won't bother playing it. So I am actually running late, but I'll, I'll keep going because I don't want to overrun on Wednesday as well. Uh, so I just need to plow through a few more things. Right, so we've done, uh, done tic-tac-toe, we've done chess. Are there other competitive games um, that we might be able to extend these ideas to? Yes, there are. And one of those games is War. So again, another clip from War Games. So again, you know, fictionalized for dramatic purposes, but this was sort of real. There was work done strategically to try and figure out, you know, how you would execute a nuclear war if one were to occur. Uh, in fact, uh, some of this stuff was done by a, a famous uh, organization called the Rand Corporation. Anybody heard of the Rand Corporation? Uh, who were like, you know, modelers and planners and this kind of thing. Uh, just to give you an example of the kind of thing they did, they would actually produce papers strategizing about uh, games of strategy, which would include war. So here's the games of strategy, saddle points, blah, 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 down here, convex payoffs, tactical air war game. You can, you can actually read the paper now if you want. Mm, I was hoping that the search would work. Maybe I need to just scroll down to it. It's uh, page 150 odds or something. So here we are. Game, timings, blah, blah, blah. Can we make this go away? Uh, so you can see, it's the, the math isn't like super complicated. This was written in the 60s. Um, where they're just trying to figure out, 
you know, how different strategies would pay off against each other if you were in some uh, hypothetical uh, game, bullets and stuff. Uh, here we go. I think it should be the next the next section, maybe. Um, there we go. Tactical air war game. Right. So they actually try and figure out what the strategies were going to be if uh, if we got into a shooting war with the Ruskies. Try and figure it out with maths and computers. And that's again, that's kind of what the the, the, the movie is kind of a riff on that idea. Um, so another little clip just to get you primed up for this stuff. So here's the, this is kind of fake history of the character in the film who was the LAI researcher, but this stuff is quite a good like recreation of actual early kind of work that was that was done. Um, Oh, no, 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 but the question there is, the, the idea is that the next thing that would be good for a, a game system is if it learned, because up to now we've seen these, you know, these tree search things, it's like they always play the same way, right? I mean, for a given move, the, the tree is always the same tree. It's the one defined by the rules of the game. So there's no, you know, it never gets any better. It just does what it does. What you really want to do in like a real human player, a, a human player gets better over time. So if you had, you really want to have a learning algorithm as part of intelligence. So... Learning is a difficult thing to define, um, ironically enough. It's also what you're supposed to be doing here. Um, but I would say it's something to do with uh, being able to react differently to repeated stimulation because you've actually accumulated knowledge over time. Uh, worth comparing that with the popular definition of insanity. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. It's also a good definition of machine learning. Yeah, I suppose so. Um, so that, that quote, by the way, doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result. Anyone know who said that? Einstein, supposedly. Supposedly. Wrongly, but supposedly. <laughs> so it's another false attribution. It wasn't really Einstein. You can this, this link explains the, the history. It's, it's almost certainly a false attribution. Um, but yeah, that's a sort of idea of what learning might be. Um, so uh, in order to learn, you obviously have to change over time. You know, so you've got to have a memory that can change. So, that you, so confronted with the same the same chessboard again, you would do something different from what you did the last time. Because last time, maybe you made a bad move and you lost. And it's like, okay, I'll learn, like, don't, don't put your queen in that vulnerable position because it's stupid. And you kind of learn to not do it. And this is a thing that most programs don't really do yet if they're brute forcing. But you would want them to if they were intelligent. Uh, so you need a bit of memory and ability to change over time. Um, so, for example, a learning chess program wouldn't just have a, a hard-coded strategy. It would have a strategy that it could adjust. One of the ways it could do that is there's a bit where when you think a certain number moves ahead, it evaluates the, 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 the final board state, which is almost certainly not a complete victory or a defeat. It's, a, it's an intermediate state. So you do the, you know, the counting up the pieces. Well, the idea is that, let's say you keep losing, you have to assume that your algorithm for counting up the pieces can't, isn't the right one. And that you should maybe, if you keep losing, you should change the weights that you apply to those pieces, or you should make that evaluation algorithm a bit different. And in theory, that's what a learning system would do. It would kind of interpret feedback from its victories and successes to tell it, yeah, do more of that thing you were doing if it wins, do less of that thing if you're losing, and adjust your adjust your strategy somehow. And Turing actually suggested this. It's in Turing's paper in 1950. He suggested that you could uh, tweak the evaluation function in response to feedback from whether you were winning or losing. And that would be how you would try and uh, make something learn. So it's a reward and punishment system. So Turing mentioned this, that uh, what you would do is the, the machine would receive feedback. Um, but it's easier said than done because you, you can know that you've won or lost. But the problem is you don't necessarily know why you won or lost. You know, you don't know what was the bad move. It could have been, you know, you could have made a bad move right at the start or you could have made it in the middle or you could make it at the end. So there's this problem in real AI right now that you're trying to train these systems, but you don't always know which thing you should be changing. Um, so that's just one of the puzzles of AI, how to, how to work out the attribution of like, what should I change to be better than I am? 
nevertheless, in theory, you could maybe do something like that. And to some extent, modern learning systems, I'll talk a little bit about them on Wednesday, you know, neural nets and stuff, that's what they do. They, they get trained, you know, when they produce a, a rubbish answer, they know that, OK, I need to change something somewhere. And it's like, well, but what exactly do I change? So they try, it's called backpropagation, or there are other techniques where they try and change some of the internal weights so that they get um, closer to the, the preferred answer. Um, so that's another way of doing this that you maybe haven't heard of uh, called genetic algorithms. So the idea there is where you encode part of the strategy as if it were like a, as if it were a chromosome almost, you know, a, a set of like magic numbers. And the idea is that you try a bunch of these at random and just see which ones work. You know, like try a bunch of random strategies. And then you take the strategies that seem to win and you breed them with each other. Which is to say, you take their chromosome or their magic numbers and you try and create like a hybrid of the ones that were good. And then you add some randomness, just like evolution, to try and create something that, you know, is maybe going to be better or worse. And if you're lucky, it's better. So you do generation after generation of like randomly trying stuff and and taking the ones that don't work and throwing them away and taking the ones that do work and breeding them and tweaking them in the hope that you get better. And that way you can kind of discover an algorithm that you didn't really know what it was when you started. You found it by evolving it. And this has actually been done. So uh, I'll show you just a little, there's, a, there's an article here you can read about it. And it's just a video to give you the idea of it. This is a thing that they do often to try and uh, to make systems that can do locomotion, you know, like walking robots and stuff. It's really hard to analytically figure it out. So one of the things you sometimes do is you just try to evolve strategies to figure out, like, you know, what is the timing that I need to move my limbs to make me actually walk properly, which might be what happened when locomotion really evolved.